<laughs> Thank you. I brought my own glass of water, so <laughs> consider it done. <laughs> Um, welcome everyone. I'd like to start by reading an excerpt by Henry Miller. And uh, he wrote this in um, as a, his response to a book that he was reviewing um, by psychoanalyst Graham Howe. The art of living is based on rhythm, on give and take, ebb and flow, light and dark, life and death by acceptance of all aspects of life, good and bad, right and wrong, yours and mine, the static, defensive life, which is what most people are cursed with, is converted into a dance, the dance of life, metamorphosis. One can dance to sorrow or to joy. One can even dance abstractly. But the point is that by the mere act of dancing, the elements which compose it are transformed. The dance is an end in itself, just like life. The acceptance of the situation, any situation, brings about a flow, a rhythmic impulse towards self-expression. To relax is, of course, the first thing a dancer has to learn. It's the first thing anyone has to learn in order to live. It's extremely difficult because it means surrender, full surrender. So I called this talk Dancing with Depression because many people see depression as being stuck, unmoving and going nowhere. But Buddhism teaches that depression can be a time of growth. And it can be counterintuitive because when we think of growth, we think of living organisms that are thriving, pushing up and out and blossoming. But depression is a different kind of growth. So I like to use an analogy and I've used this before. Um, there's a liana vine that grows in South, uh, South America in the rainforest. And in the rainforest, there are three la layers. And at the very top is a canopy and a lot of the tallest trees grow upwards to the sunlight. So you can, it's fairly understandable. In order to grow, you need light and some of the tallest trees, they compete and so they become even bigger than all the other trees in order to maximize on this light. And the liana vine will climb up one of these very tall trees in order to get sunlight to photosynthesize and thrive. And once it's up there, happily getting all the sun that it needs, it then starts to make these pods and the pods drop down into the ground. It breaks open and the roots grow. Like all plants, seeds will start to develop roots and go into the ground. But the liana vine is negatively heliotropic, so it doesn't start to grow up again. It actually grows away from the light and grows towards the darkest part of the soil. And so then it travels along and it does this for some time until it finds a big tree. And then it starts to climb upwards towards the sunlight. So it's nice to see George because um, we've been actually spending some time in our Wednesday Sangha meetings looking at the life of Siddhartha Gautama and reflecting on the different phases of his life and thinking about our own journey. And just like the liana vine and also Siddhartha's life, you can break it down into different phases. And so his story always starts with the night of his enlightenment. But what I'm interested in is the time leading up to his night of enlightenment. So that, uh, that part, when you think about what he was going through before he reached enlightenment is when he's in the dark, he's very much in the forest. And it's, 
uh, it's a time when he doesn't know. He doesn't know what he's about to discover. He doesn't know whether his own journey is going to get him to a place where he can actually feel like he's accomplished something. And so if you think about that time, it's six years of his life of really searching, really wanting to know some answers, but not really knowing, is it going to take six years? Might it take longer? Maybe he'll never actually get to reaching enlightenment. So this is the phase of his life that I like to consider his depression. Because he wasn't getting any enjoyment out of life. He deliberately chose not to eat. And so if we were looking at him from the outside, we could describe him as someone who's lacking in appetite. He had low energy. What did he do? He just sat there. So he's not very active and he's growing weaker and weaker day by day because he's not taking in any food. He avoided contact with friends and he didn't have a social life. So he, remember the time before he left to go into the forest, he was cultivating and learning so many skills. He was skilled in archery. He was learning so many things. He was highly intelligent, educated, active. And then this time in the forest, he stops all of that. He has no, no wish to engage with anything. And he, so there's very little that's said about this time. And so we don't know about how his family life was, but you could say that the time he left, he left his wife and newborn. And so you could say that he was having difficulties at home. And all of these things, all these descriptions match someone who's suffering from depression. So he continues carrying on and doing it for one year. Can you imagine? And then another year and another year. So it's not a fast process. He spends quite a bit of time really not really knowing and being in a place where he's having to face so many things that are difficult to face. And so there's stories of being tempted by Mara. There's stories of being confronted by so many, so many things just on the eve of enlightenment. But even before that, he's at the point where he's, uh, he's severely malnourished. And he didn't even know that there would be anyone who would come and offer him any food. So in the story, there comes a figure, Sujata offers him food, but he, he didn't conjure up this person. This is someone who actually came into his life, offered him something, took pity on him. And so in a way, she is like the structure that the liana vine can climb up. She gives him enough nourishment to keep him going so that he can find his way back to the light. So this time an experience in the forest, I think is really crucial. It's not written about very much, but there's something about this time uh, being sort of like the, the preparation for the ground that then led to his enlightenment. And I believe it's an experience that we can learn a lot from. And so I feel that his enlightenment is his way of helping other people to go into the darkness. So I just thought um, a list, you know, there's so many different causes of depression. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about um, uh, depression. I think I'll say some things about it, but what I'd like is to open it up to discussion so that we can have a meaningful conversation that's relevant to you and to, and to share uh, whatever uh, experiences or questions and so that we can actually make it relevant to 
to you who are here today. But I just thought just to help sort of understand some of the um, some of the the causes of depression it might just give us enough to sort of um, get our teeth into something. So, and and this isn't an exhaustive list. I just thought you know these four are, are, are uh, they cover a wide ground. So so the first is mental exhaustion. Uh, this is. It, so we, we know the first noble truth is suffering and with suffering we feel in touch with lots of energy that rises up these raw emotions and sometimes if they're too raw and too overwhelming uh, it can almost feel like a hurricane that's swirling around us and what we're trying to do is to avoid getting caught in that awful hurricane but that in itself takes a lot of energy. And so it's almost like the energy that we use in order to avoid feeling overwhelmed by our own raw emotions exhausts us and leaves us feeling depressed, leaves us feeling like we have no energy to do anything else. And the second one is learned behavior. So there's a story that I read a while ago when I was pregnant about um, a couple that visited an orphanage. And when they went to the orphanage, uh, all the babies were quiet and um, settled. And the the woman was amazed. She, she couldn't believe all these babies all together in one room and not one of them crying. And so she asked the, the people in charge and she just expressed her amazement and, and they kind of looked at her baffled. They said, well, they, the babies don't come in like this. They, they start off crying and screaming, but um, there's not enough people to see to the babies. And so after a while, the babies stop crying. And so the babies learn that there's no, there's no point in crying because no one will come to them. And I also talked to some other people who were um, as a child in a hospital where they they did controlled crying and they found that um, if they were left without um, a caring nurse or staff, they were settled. And so to avoid unsettling or distressing the child, they refuse contact with nurses or family members just to keep the child settled and calm. So this is a learned behavior. Um, if we find that we're struggling, we cry out and no one comes, then we'll probably shut down and stop feeling things. So the conditions that we're in will have an influence on our behavior. And even with this current pandemic, we can see how this crisis has led to learning certain behaviors like social distancing, coughing into arms, wearing masks, avoiding crowded places, feeling nervous of other people. And we learn how to behave. We're being taught certain behaviors. And what will be interesting to see is how much of our uh, these behaviors that we've learned will carry on after the pandemic finishes. There is a tendency for us to, um, we, we're creatures of habit. So there is a tendency for us to keep a habit going even after the cause of it has gone. And so we know that another way for learning um, how to behave is by copying other people. And so it could be that um, adults who suffer from depression may have been brought up in a family where their parents suffered from depression and that was their normal. So what they learned was a behavior that uh, they saw as they were growing up. And then another cause is a physical illness. So there's enough experience now to show us that the mind and the body is connected. And so it could be that a lack of energy has to do with a physical Ill injury. The person who breaks a leg, for example, will have to rest their leg. 
but it could be that the illness is invisible. It could be um, something that is uh, internal that you can't see, but the body has to have some time to heal and in turn and in, in healing and in stopping um, using energy that takes away from the healing process, it may come across as a lack of energy and a kind of depression. And then that lack of energy could also lead to other symptoms like poor sleeping habits or a poor diet, which could then create a vicious cycle so that one gets trapped in not ever regaining the energy back. So sometimes there's a there's an important reason to stop and to allow the body to heal, just like any animal that's wounded, animals in nature, if, if they're hurt, they'll find a nice dark place to rest and to lick their wounds in order to heal. And it could be that the hurt is spiritual and that the person needs time to heal. But again, what's difficult about that is there's no visible sign of a spiritual illness. And so then there's no knowing when that injury or that hurt has been healed. So it can be very hard to actually give oneself enough time to heal because how would you know when, when you're healed if you can't see it? And then another cause is, um, is a spiritual void. So I, I grew up in Canada and what I found was interesting is that when I got to university, a lot of people I knew were taking antidepressants either my friends or parents of my friends. And given that most of the people that I knew who were taking antidepressants were comfortable, average, had everything materialistically, were sheltered, um, there was something, there, there was something that although on the, on, the, on the superficial appearance, everyone looked okay, some, it, was, it was pretty, obvious that something was wrong, that there was a void that was gnawing away, a sense that something is wrong or that there's something wrong with me. And so they were, they were doing things, but there was no, there, there, there was no excitement, uh, no meaning almost, and um, in the sense of uh, kind of languishing in their jobs and in their families. And so Buddhist practice can help us learn how to dance with depression. It, uh, it really is about not knowing what the solution is, but just to be okay with the sense of not knowing, the sense that if we can stop and hold the emotions that are there, and even to see if there is something like... Um, a depression that might be masking anger that one doesn't really want to feel or any kind of emotion that one feels will lead them to not coping, then even under that, there might be um, something painful, something that is hurting them. And so this always seems to lead back to dukkha. And so the so so to be with the the dukkha to be with not knowing um just like the buddha didn't know when he went into the forest is a shining light on something that can be really important and that can transform and so there is a process uh where we can see that something can happen if we can stop and see what happens to us when we encounter dukkha. And this is when we can learn a lot about ourselves and our reality. So we might see that we're clinging on to certain things that led to certain feelings. We might not have even been aware of some of the things that we were holding on to until uh, something happens and it, um, it, it, 
it proved to be a disaster. And so all these things that are taken away from us, our losses, our dukkha, and all these things that we are attached to are things that include people, jobs, work, health, and even our own thoughts and feelings, our beliefs. So one of the things that that Buddhist practice also helps us to see is that it's really hard to stay with not knowing, to stay with difficult feelings if we haven't got support. And so to know what support is there. So similar to say the, the pod that's in the underground in, even in the darkest places when we think we're alone, if we can at that point open our eyes, it's like wake up to see what is supporting us in that dark space, because there will be something. So for the Buddha in the forest, it happened to be a complete stranger. And also earth itself, the trees, the air, the sun, so there will always be things that are reliable and sometimes timeless, unconditional. So if we can tap into that sort of support, then we might just find that we have enough to help us be with feelings that come and go, um, things that we relied upon that weren't actually reliable. And all these things in Buddhism we call our refuges. So things that we place our trust in, things that we, we think will give us that support, that comfort, that relief. And so a refuge can be anything really. It can, it, it, it can be anything that we trust, anything that we think will will help us. But for Buddhists, um, we're looking for an ultimate refuge that is always reliable. And that is the Dharma or love itself. So, so we can talk more about what refuge means if that helps. But no matter where we are, no matter where we find ourselves, whether life is great and the music is joyful and we find it easy to dance to, or whether it's really somber and, and deadening, then we can still find a movement to go with it. And so part of it is to listen to what sort of music, what song is being played and how are we dancing to it? So I'd like to just stop now and just check and uh, see whether whether there are any reflections and comments or questions.